for several warm summer days in the year 3 E407, a young, pretty Donma woman in a veil regularly visited one of the master armourers in the city of Tyr. The locals decided that she was young and pretty by a figure in her pose, though no one ever saw her face. She and the armourer would retire to the back of his shop, and he would close down his business and dismiss his apprentices for a few hours. Then, at mid-afternoon, she would leave, only to return at precisely the same time the next day. As gossip goes, it was fairly meagre stuff, though what the old man was doing with such a well-dressed and attractively proportioned woman was the source of several crude jokes. After several weeks, the visits stopped, and life returned to normal in the slums of Tyr. It was not until a month or two after the visits had stopped that in one of the many taverns in the neighbourhood, a young local tailor, having imbibed too much sauce, asked the armourer, So, what happened to your lady friend? You break her heart? The armourer, well aware of the rumours, simply replied, She was a proper young lady of quality. There was nothing between her and the likes of me. What was she doing at your shop every day for? asked her tavern wench, who had been dying to get the subject open. If you must know, said the armourer, I was teaching her the craft. You're putting us on, laughed the tailor. No, the young lady had a particular fascination with my particular kind of artistry, the armourer said with a hint of pride before getting lost in the reverie. I taught her how to mend swords specifically, from all kinds of nicks and breaks, hairline fissures, cracked pommels, quillions, and grips. When she started, she had no idea how to secure the grips to the tang of the blade. Well, of course she was green to start with, why wouldn't she be? But she wasn't afraid to get her hands dirty. I taught her how to patch her little silver inlaid and the gold filigree, you find them really fine blades, and how to polish it all to a mirror sheen so the sword looked like the gods just pulled it from their celestial anvil. The tavern wench and the tailor laughed out loud. No matter what he alleged, the armor was speaking of the young lady's training as another man speaks of a long lost love. More of the locals in the tavern would have listened to the armor's pathetic tale, but more important gossip had taken precedence. There was another murdered slave trader found at the centre of the town, gutted from fore to aft. That made six of them, total, in barely a fortnight. Some called the killer the liberator, but that sort of anti-slavery zeal was rare among the common folk. They preferred calling him the lopper, as several of the earlier victims had been completely beheaded. Others had been simply perforated, sliced or gutted, but the lopper still kept his original sobriquet. Why, the enthusiastic hooligans made bets about the conditions of the next slave trader's corpse. Several dozen of the surviving members of that trade were meeting at the manor house of Sergio Dress Minigor. Minigor was a minor houseman of House Dress, but a major member of the slave trading fraternity. Perhaps his best years were behind him, but his associates still counted on him for wisdom. We need to take what we know of this lopper and search accordingly, said Minigor, seated in front of his opulent half. We know he has an unreasonable hatred of slavery and slave traders. We know he's skilled with a blade. We know he has the stealth and finesse to execute our most well-secured brethren in their most secure abodes. It sounds to me to be an adventurer. An outlander, surely no citizen of Morrowind would strike us like this. The slave traders nodded in agreement. An outlander seemed most likely for their troubles. It was always true. Were I fifty years younger, I'd take down my blade Akarash from the half. Manigor made an expansive gesture to this shimmering weapon. And join you in seeking out this terror. Search him out where adventurers meet, taverns and guildhalls. Then show him a little lopping of my own. The slave traders laughed politely. You wouldn't let us borrow your blade for the execution, I suppose, would you, Sergio? Ah, Saron Jealous, a young toading slaver, enthusiastically. 
It would be an excellent use of Akrash, sighed Minigul. But I vowed to retire her when I retired. Minigul called for his daughter Pelea to bring the slaves Morflin, but they waved the girl away. It was a night for hunting the lopper, not drinking away the troubles. Minigul hardly approved of their devotion in particular, as expensive as the liquor was getting to be. When the last of the slavers had left, the old man kissed his daughter on the head, took one last admiring look at Akarash, and toddled off to his bed. No sooner had he done so than Pelea had the blade off the mantle, and she was flying with it across the field behind the manor house. She knew Kazar had been waiting for her for hours in the stable. He sprung out at her from the shadows, and wrapping his strong furry arms around her, kissed her long and sweet. Holding him as long as she dared to, she finally broke away and handed him the blade. He tested its edge. The finest Khajiit swordsmith couldn't hone an edge this keen, he said, looking at his beloved with pride. And I know I nicked it up pretty good last night. That you did, said Player. You must have cut through an iron caress. The slavers are taking precautions now, he replied. What did they say during their meeting? They think it's an outlander adventurer, she laughed. It didn't occur to any of them that a Khajiit slave would possess the skill to commit these loppings. And your father doesn't suspect that it's his dear Akarash that is striking in the heart of oppression. Why would he, when every day you find it as fresh as the day before? Now, I must go before anyone notices I'm gone. My nurse sometimes comes in and asks me some details about the wedding, as if I have any choice in the matter. I promise you, said Karazar very seriously, you will not be forced in any marriage to cement your family's slave-dealing dynasty. The last Garabad of Akrash will be sheathed into your father's heart, and when you are an orphan, you can free the slaves, move to a more enlightened province, and marry who you like. I wonder who that will be, Pelea teased, and raced out of the stables. Just before dawn, Pelea awoke and crept out to the garden where she found Akarash hidden in the bitter green vines. The edge was still relatively keen, but there were scratches vertically across the blade's surface. Another beheading, she thought, as she took pomace stone and patiently rubbed out the marks, finally polishing it with a solution of salt of vigna. It was up on the mantel in pristine condition when the father came into the sitting room for his breakfast. When the news came, that Kirimith Toram, player's husband-to-be, had been found outside of a canton, his head on a spike, some feet away. She did not pretend to grieve. Her father knew she did not want to marry him. It is a shame, he said, that lad was a good slaver, but there are plenty of other young men who would appreciate an alliance with our family. What about the young Soron Jealous? Two days, nights later, Soron Jealous was visited by the Lopper. The struggle did not take long, but Saron had armed himself with one small defence. A needle dripped in the eye of a poison plant, hidden up his sleeve. After the mortal blow, he collapsed forward and struck Karazar in the calf with the pin. By the time he made it back to the Minigora Manor House, he was dying. Vision blurring, he climbed up to the eaves of the house to play his window and rapped. Player did not answer immediately, as she was in a deep, wonderful sleep, dreaming about her future with her Khajiit lover. He rapped louder, which woke up not only Player, but her father in the next room. Karazar, she cried, opening up the window. The next person in the bedroom was Minagor himself. As he saw it, this slave was about to lob off the head of his daughter with his sword suddenly. With the energy of a young man, Minigor rushed at the dying Khajiit, knocking the sword out of his hand before Player could stop him. Her father had thrust the blade into her lover's heart. The excitement was over. The old man dropped the sword and turned the door to call the guard. As an afterthought, it occurred to him to make certain that his daughter hadn't been injured and might require a healer. Minigor turned to her. For a moment, he felt simply disorientated feeling the force of the blow, but not the blade itself. Then he saw the blood, and then felt the pain. 
Before he fully realised that his daughter had stabbed him with Akarash, he was dead. The blade, at last, had had its scabbard. A week later, after the official investigations, the slave was burned in an unmarked grave in a manor field, and Sergio Dress Minigor found his resting place in a modest corner of the family's opulent mausoleum. A larger crowd of curious onlookers came into view of the funeral of the noble slaver whose secret life was as the savage lopper of these competitors. The audience was respectfully quiet, though there was not a person there not imagining the final moments of the man's life. Attacking his own daughter in his madness, luckily defended by the loyal, hapless slave before turning the blade on himself. Among the viewers was an old armourer who saw for one last time the veiled young lady before she disappeared forever from Tyr.